start recording. All right, um, welcome everyone to our last, uh, last lecture. Um, so next week, you know, it is going to be your time uh, to present your projects. Uh, again, a few announcements. Um, so the deadline for the projects is this uh, Monday uh, for your report and the presentation is gonna happen next week. And you can find uh, slides of today in our GitHub link as usual. So last week we talked about advanced topics in computer vision. And uh, today we will um, cover unsupervised learning with uh, focus on generative models. And uh, our source material is um, our book, our textbook, which is Dive into Deep Learning. And also this time I uh, used the slides from, um, from uh, Berkeley's uh, course CS294. Okay, so what is unsupervised learning? Unsupervised learning is actually uh, capturing rich patterns in raw data in a label-free way. What do I mean by label-free? For example, I just give you a bunch of images, but I'm not telling you which one is a dog or a cat. And I just um, ask you, um, find some kind of general pattern, some kind of a representation. So, we can actually consider two types of uh, capturing rich patterns in the data. So one is generative model. Can we actually recreate raw data distribution? So if I, can, if I can learn the distribution of the data, then I can generate similar looking data. Uh, and we will discuss why it will be useful in machine learning. And also, uh, self-supervised learning, for example, um, a puzzle task that requires semantic understanding. So if I, um, if I uh, black, black, uh, black out some of the image, for example, then I might ask you to fill the rest of the image. And what are the applications of unsupervised learning? Uh, one is clustering. You can um, cluster your data into uh, some number of clusters so you can have more general idea. Uh, you can also use uh, for visualization, which is uh, similar to clustering. And also you can reduce the dimension because your data sometimes might be really high dimensional, but you may not need that many dimensions or that many features in your data for your machine learning tasks. And um, also, you may want to use unsupervised learning for anomaly detection. For example, uh, if suddenly something changes in your data, you may want to uh, catch it. Or uh, you can use, uh, again, unsupervised learning for generating some synthetic data too, because if you can learn the distribution of the data, you can also generate some similar looking data, which is actually not real data, but represents the real data. So one of the um, prior works about this is uh, by Hinton, Deep Belief Networks. Uh, in that paper, they actually show that uh, given an image, if I, can, um, if I can predict what label it is, and then given the label, I can actually generate you the image itself. So here, they show some of the generated images using their deep belief networks. And all of these images are actually fake images. What I mean by fake is they are generated randomly by the, uh, by the network itself. Or um, as in variational autoencoders, we can just input some noise to data and then to, to network, sorry. So we can input some noise to our network to generate some, uh, some images that look like the ones in our training data. For example, here it shows that uh, imagine I, I input two dimensional noise. So if I change the noise in this, in this direction and also in this direction, so these represent two different dimensions, then the representation that I'm generating um, also changes. And again, all these images are actually fake. Or as in GANs that we discussed um, last week, here 
uh, both of the images on left and right uh, show the synthetic images generated by GAN. And for each uh, type of the image, the last column actually represents the real images from the data. And the ones uh, that are not um, framed by this yellow color are actually uh, fake images generated. So you can see that these um, faces, for example, look uh, pretty, uh, pretty realistic. And uh, with DC GAN, we can even improve the quality of these generated images. Or you can even generate an audio. For example, um, in this uh, paper called uh, WaveNet, in, in this method called WaveNet, uh, here they asked the linguist, uh, linguistics uh, how, how much score they give to the generated data sets. And the WaveNet actually performed really well um, uh, compared to the baseline method. Or we can even generate a video. So we can, we can even make movies uh, that are um, produced by a neural network itself, if we can learn the distribution of the data. And of course, if you can generate images and also uh, audio, why can't you generate text? So you can also generate text that looks like written by Shakespeare. And um, we can also use uh, unsupervised learning for compression as, as well. Uh, so for example, in this, uh, in this paper uh, from last year, they show that generative models provide better bit rates than distribution unaware methods like JPEG, et cetera. All right, so I hope I convinced you why it is nice to have the distribution of the data or to learn the distribution of data. Um, so that we can generate some uh, realistic looking synthetic images or audio or text. So now let's uh, talk about the likelihood based models. Say we would like to synthesize data from its own distribution, right? So you still need some sort of a training data to learn the distribution. So let's call the distribution of the data is P data. And these are our samples from X1 to Xn. And we want to estimate this P data. And once we learn this distribution, we can sample from it, right? So if you give me some P of X, I can actually just give you some samples that come from that distribution. So what are the challenges here? First, we want to estimate distributions of complex high dimensional data. For example, an image that is of size 128 by 128 with three channels um, lies in about 50,000 dimensional space. So we need to find the distribution that represents 50,000 dimensional uh, space, which is a pretty challenging task to do. And also we want computational and statistical efficiency. So we want efficient training and model representation expressiveness and generalization. We talked about generalization before and uh, sampling quality and speed. So uh, once we generate these uh, synthetic samples, we actually want them to have high quality and also we want good compression rate and speed. So instead, can we actually learn a parameterized function P theta of X? So can we actually perform some function approximation so we can learn the theta, the parameters of P theta of X that is um, approximately like P data. So given data X1 to Xn sampled from a tree distribution P data, we can actually pose the problem over the parameters of this distribution P theta with some loss function. So the loss function will have all these samples that are from X1 to Xn and also our parameter theta. And our uh, goal will be to minimize this loss over theta, okay? And um, here the question is what the loss should be. You can think of the loss as a distance between the distribution. So I want to minimize the distribution between P data, which is the uh, true distribution, 
and p theta x is the parameterized distribution that we define and we try to approximate. And um, the training procedure can only see the empirical data distribution, of course, not the true distribution. So uh, we want to, uh, we have to use only the data x1 to xn. We don't really know what p data is. We are only given uh, the values, the samples from this distribution. Um, and also we want the model to generalize, right? So uh, we don't want to focus only on a few samples that are given to us. We want uh, our uh, learned distribution to be as general as possible. So let's uh, revisit maximum likelihood. Uh, given a data set, we want to find theta by solving this distribution. So, uh, sorry, by solving this um, uh, optimization. So basically, again, we want to minimize some loss given theta uh, and also the observations. So in this case, we can just use the log likelihood, right? Um, and what does this correspond to? This is actually equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence between empirical distribution and the model. So you can represent the empirical distribution as like this. Here, one means, uh, you can think one is like a delta drug function. So the value of this uh, expression is one if x is equal to xi, zero uh, uh, if not. And let's assume they are all um, equal, all uh, samples are equally observed. So if we want to minimize the KL divergence between our parameterized distribution P theta and also the empirical distribution P data, uh, P hat data, we need this hat because um, X1, Xn only represents the empirical distribution because we don't know the true distribution. And if we, write this uh, expression down with the KL divergence between these two distributions, we will actually see that it has two terms. Here, the second term doesn't depend on the parameter theta that we are interested in. So only this first term depends on the theta. And if you, if you look at this term, it's actually what we have here is uh, log likelihood, okay? This is what we discussed at the beginning of uh, our classes too. So now um, let's talk about designing the model. We will choose P theta to be deep neural networks, right? So this is, uh, so how, how are we going to pick some distribution? So we want to use deep neural networks because they are expressive enough. Um, and we also know how to train them, but our design should satisfy these conditions. So first uh, the uh, summation over all the X should be one and also each value of this uh, probability distribution should be uh, greater than zero. And um, also this log of P theta X should be easy to evaluate and also differentiate with respect to theta because we need to compute the gradients uh, for our SGD, right? And this can be a tricky setup, of course. So, can we actually use some kind of latent variable models? So instead of modeling the distribution in the original uh, date, the original dimension, can you model this distribution in some hidden space that is actually easier to handle? Um, and um, some random variables, um, we, we can assume that some random variables are hidden and we do not observe them. For example, if we, if we observe X, and there might, there might be some hidden variable that's actually causing X, but we don't observe X, the, we don't observe this uh, hidden variable, okay? So why latent variable models? As I said, they are simpler uh, because they are lower di uh, dimensional representation of data and it is often possible and um, LV, uh, latent variable models can automatically identify those hidden representations. For example, um, for this uh, image, uh, you can see that um, we can just represent each pixel here with, uh, with some, uh, uh, 
some kind of a uh, representation. Here we say for this object, it is corgi, red, white. And here for this object, we say corgi, red, white, floppy left ear, and so on. And uh, other models, uh, other traditional models, such as autoregressive models, are slow to sample because they assume that all pixels are uh, dependent on each other. Uh, but we can make part of observation space independent condition on some latent variables. Uh, that's why LVMs can have faster sampling by exploding some statistical patterns. So you don't need to assume that each pixel is um, um, dependent on each other, but uh, given the hidden dimension or the hidden representation, we can assume that those pixels are independent, conditionally independent from each other. And um, sometimes it is possible to design a latent variable model with an understanding of the causal process that generates the data. But in general, we don't know what are the latent variables and how they interact with observations. And most popular models make little assumption about what are the latent variables. And best way to specify latent variables is still an active area of research. So for example, um, we can assume that our hidden variable Z have some sort of a distribution that's parameterized by beta. And then we can assume that um, the variable that we observe, which is X, um, can be conditioned on this hidden variable Z. So there can be, we, we can represent this conditional distribution uh, X given hidden variable and the parameters are theta. And we can assume that this distribution is actually Bernoulli. And we can even assume that each of these Xi's are conditionally independent when you give me Z. So basically the idea with the latent variable model is that let's sample Z from some, um, some distribution, PZ, and given Z, we can sample X uh, from this conditional distribution, X given Z parameterized by theta. And we can compute the uh, probability of X as a summation of over Z conditional distribution times the prior distribution. And you know, so this will be our likelihood. And then we can train our model so that we maximize this likelihood over the parameter theta. So if I replace this log p theta x with what I have here, then I can, I can have this representation. And we can call that um, going from x to z actually uh, represents the data in lower dimension or, or in hidden dimension. So uh, the Let's talk about the training uh, latent variable models. So what is the objective? Objective is again, given Z and X, we want to maximize this uh, log likelihood over theta. So there are two scenarios for this Z. In scenario one, Z can only take on a small number of values, in which case exact object, objective is tractable. So we can just write down the exact objective function here, and you can just solve the optimization problem. But in scenario two, Z can take on an impractical number of values to enumerate. So in that case, we have to use some approximate uh, solution for our objective. So an example for exact likelihood objective, uh, so let's consider a mix mixture of three Gaussians with uniform prior over components. So this is, um, we, we can write this, uh, our distribution is a summation of conditional distribution times the prior distribution. And let's assume uh, for the prior distribution, Z can only take three values, uh, A, B, C, and each value, uh, each probability is one, one third, okay? And let's also assume the conditional distribution of X given Z is represented as a Gaussian distribution. 
but it depends on the value of Z here. That's why it is a mixture of three Gaussians here. And the training objective becomes, um, again, maximum of theta and maximum over theta across all the observations of logarithmic um, likelihood, log likelihood. And here the theta, thetas are sigma and um, sigma and mu. The, so here mu is the uh, mean of the distribution that we are interested in and sigma is the covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution. And then we can just plug in uh, these two distributions in our original objective function and we can write it down and we can find um, which, value, which values uh, maximize uh, this log likelihood. And um, so this is an example. So this is the um, training data, given training data. So if we, uh, if we optimize that uh, log likelihood that I just showed in the previous slide over some epochs, we can actually start to learn the distribution of the data, the parameters of the data, I mean. Okay, so, um, in prior sampling, the main idea is that if Z can take on many values, what do we do? So in that case, we can sample Z as many times as we want. So for example, here, so this was our original log likelihood. And um, so we can actually sample Z K times and write down this conditional distribution and here z, each z comes from this prior distribution. And then we can run SGD on this approximate objective. So this is different than the exact um, objective that we had because uh, what we had before was that z could only take specific number of values. But in this case, if it, takes, uh, if, if it can take many values, then you need some sort of an approximation. So here we are just uh, assuming that if I sample it k times, it should be a pretty good approximation of my objective. Uh, but here the challenge is that if you go to higher dimensional data, it becomes almost impossible to be lucky enough that a sampled z is a good match for a data point xi. So, then we actually can uh, use importance sampling. Here the problem setting is that, again, we want to compute uh, this, uh, some sort of a, a function of Z, where these, these are um, sampled from some prior distribution, PZ. So in this case, this F, F of Z, you can think F of Z as, as, um, as this, as the conditional probability. And, um, but yeah, so it is hard to sample from PZ and samples are not very informative. So the formulation of importance sampling says that, so if I want to compute the expectations of some F of Z, where Zs are sampled from some prior distribution, um, I can just uh, write it as uh, this summation and then I can just um, multiply and divide by some Q of Z. Here, instead of sampling from PZ, I can actually sample from QZ and compute the expectation on this distribution, or oh, sorry, on this expression. And we can assume that uh, approximately, this expression can be equal to uh, this summation averaged over k samples. And let's say it is easy. So we, we picked Q of Z so that it is easier to sample, okay? And um, so basically we can sample from Q to compute the expectation with respect to P, okay? And um, for the latent variable model, then our training objective becomes um, like this. So this uh, second summation can be replaced by this important sampling that we just discussed 
Here, the Zs are uh, sampled from some easy distribution. And, um, but what is the good proposal distribution of Q, right? So what do we want? We want samples compatible with Xi. So instead of having just QZ independently, can we actually make it conditioned on Xi's? So there will be some relationship between our sample Z and also our, um, our inputs Xi. And the problem here is that it's not clear how to sample from this distribution. And um, this actually leads us to variational approach. The general principle uh, of variational approach is that we can't use P we want. So instead, we propose a parameterized distribution Q that we can work with more easily and try to find the parameter setting that makes it as good as possible. So can you find some Q that's a Gaussian distribution with parameters mu and sigma square that is as close as possible to PZ given XI. So in this case, remember, we want to find this Q, uh, the distribution. So we need to optimize over this distribution, right? So let's optimize to find Q. So we can use KL divergence again. Our goal is to minimize the KL divergence between distribution QZ that we want to optimize and also between uh, and, and also the condition distribution Z given XI. Okay, so we can actually uh, show that this depends on this uh, log of QZ divided by P theta Z given XI. And if you actually just uh, do the calculus here, you will see that Minimizing this KL divergence is equivalent to this term. And of course, uh, plus some constant that's independent of C. And here, all needed quantities in the objective are readily computable. And the um, general idea of amortization is that if same inference problem needs to be solved many times, can we parameterize a neural network to solve it? So for all xi, we want to solve this um, optimization function that minimizes uh, KL divergence between the condition distribution and, uh, and um, Q over Q. In this case, we have this amortized formulation that actually minimizes this KL divergence over the samples xi's. And the um, uh, advantage of doing this is that it is faster, but it is not as precise because we are using an approximation. So we can actually illustrate it, um, uh, illustrate the amortized formulation this way. So minimize the KL divergence between Q and P over some parameters of Q so basically, if I want to go to X from Z, I can use this condition distribution. And if I want to go to Z from X, uh, I have this Q phi Z given X. So in this case, can we actually have Q uh, as uh, some Gaussian distribution? And here we can assume that we can write Z as some mu plus epsilon times sigma and epsilon is going to be some, uh, some Gaussian distribution where the mean is zero and the, um, and the covariance is just identity. So this is pretty easy to sample. And can I, so if I want to sample from Z, from this distribution, and I want it to be, uh, to be dependent on my observation X as well, can I actually just uh, multiply this, this sample epsilon with this sigma that I learned and just add the mean parameter. So here it is easier to sample epsilon and it's a cheap operation to multiply this epsilon with some sigma and also it's cheap to add mu. And here I make mu and sigma to be dependent on X. 
So I created the relationship between X and Z. And um, we now have an objective um, that, is, uh, th that we can use um, stochastic optimization. So again, the KL divergence between this Q and condition Z was, can be written as this. But now, remember, what we want is we want to maximize the log likelihood of this P of X at the end of the day. This is the distribution that we want to learn and we want to sample from. So can we actually use this equation and rearrange it to write down log P of X? So the answer is yes. So log P of X can be written as minus this term plus the KL divergence here. And here we know that KL divergence is always non-negative. So this will always be uh, greater than or equal to zero. And we will have this term, which we call variational lower bound. So if I want to maximize this, I can actually maximize this part, this too. So maximizing this, will, this term, maximizing variational lower bound will, max, uh, will help me maximize the original log likelihood that I'm interested in, but it is uh, intractable to do. So uh, I want to work on this variational lower band, which is easier to work on. So given a data distribution, X, we can now uh, train the generator model by maximizing this variational lower band under the distribution. So this is what we just showed, this variational lower band. And we want to do it over, um, over our observations, P of X, uh, that is sampled from P data. And we know that this is actually upper bounded by the original expression that we are interested in. Interested in. But now the question is, how can we perform stochastic gradient on this term? So this term has uh, phi as a parameter. And in my expectation, the samples are also sampled from a distribution that has that phi parameter. So uh, how can I do stochastic optimization? We can use pathwise derivative, uh, or sometimes it's also called reparameterization trick. So when Z is continuous, we can cast Z as a function of a simple noise, such as a standard Gaussian. So I can say Z is a function of epsilon and some phi, some parameter, where epsilon is uh, from a normal distribution. And then the expectation of some function f of Z, where Zs are sampled from this Q distribution, I can actually instead write it like um, expectation of f of g of epsilon phi, where epsilons are uh, sampled from a normal distribution. So here I just replace this z with g of epsilon given phi, and instead of sampling from uh, sampling from this distribution that has the parameters that I want to take gradient with respect to, here I can just uh, do this expectation over epsilon, which is not dependent on phi. And when f is differentiable, I can write down that um, derivative of this expression, gradient of this expression with respect to parameters phi is actually equivalent to uh, gradient of this, exp this expression uh, that is where the expectation is taken across epsilon. That is easier to deal with. Okay, so now I have this trick from pathwise derivative, and also I have this um, uh, lower band term that I want to solve, and I need to compute the gradient of this term with respect to both phi and theta, taking derivative with respect to theta isn't that hard, but taking derivative with respect to phi was difficult, and we solved that problem by using pathwise derivative. So now we are ready for uh, introducing variational autoencoder. So 
let's say q z given x parameterized by phi is modeled as a Gaussian with parameters mu and sigma uh, and you can think this as a deep neural network of x so this is actually the encoder part of the variation autoencoder that, that takes x and generates z and the parameters are phi and the parameters um, phi that are mu and sigma are learned from your input x and we also have deep neural network based decoder p theta x given z which is uh, parameterized by theta so it takes your latent variable z and maps it to the original dimension x and we also assume that it is differentiable so in this case let's say we define z as um, as some uh, square square root of sigma sigma is the um, here sigma is the covariance matrix that we learn from x and phi phi uh, is the parameters and we multiply this term with epsilon that is the uh, that is sampled from a um, normal distribution and we just add the mu term that we learn from the uh, from the inputs and also from the neural network and then we can uh, write down our variational lower bands uh, so remember using this pathwise derivative i can take the expectation over this um, normal distribution and i can write down uh, the expression that we just derived as a uh, variational lower band and here actually this term um, is equivalent to KL divergence between PZ and uh, QZ given X and uh, we can compute the gradients of this term both with respect to theta and phi and um, we can compute the solution with SGD okay So you may be asking why it is called uh, autoencoder auto because it acts like this distribution that we learn uh, that is parameterized by mu and sigma uh, can, be, can be considered as an encoder part that takes the high dimensional input and represents it in a lower dimensional space. And this decoder takes this lower dimensional representation and generates the, the original dimensional data. So this decoder is X given Z, parameterized by theta. This encoder is Z given X, parameterized by phi, where phi's are mu and sigma. And um, we, we only learn mu and sigma through our neural network, but we need to sample from some unit Gaussian distribution uh, to compute the uh, forward propagation, okay? Um, so these are uh, some images generated using variation autoencoder from the original paper of VAE. And uh, here, this is actually what I described at the uh, beginning of the lecture. So if we change dimension Z1 and Z2, you see how the generated samples change. Okay, so last week we talked about uh, generative adversarial networks and we said that um, we use them to generate data and the cool thing about generative adversarial networks was that it, it learns how to generate the uh, data. It, it actually learns the uh, generative distribution so how is that related to the VAE, you might ask? So what was the objective function in GANs? So in GANs, we have uh, the generator and also this discriminator, right? So these are two play this is like a two-player minimax, minimax game between generator and discriminator. So D tries to maximize the log likelihood for the binary classification problem. So if X is from real data, it tries to assign uh, one in the output. And if um, 
X is um, a, a fake data, so which is the output of G of C, then it tries to assign zero. Okay, so it tries to maximize this, uh, this uh, expression over D. In, in the meantime, G tries to minimize the log likelihood of its samples being classified as fake. So G is trying to fool the discriminator D. Okay, so this is, um, this is a different setup than VAE. It doesn't um, really assume any, any distribution either in the hidden space or in the data itself. It, it just focuses on the samples that it's interested in. So it doesn't focus on the hidden space representation unlike VAE. And also uh, in VAE, we can, we can input any image and now look at the output, how it looks like. But in generative adversarial networks, once you train the model, you cannot input uh, some image and look at the output. So generative uh, adversarial networks are just, uh, can be just used to generate some samples given, the, uh, given some noise to the network, to the decoder. So this is how it works. So this, this figure is from uh, NeurIPS 2016 GAN tutorial. So let's say this is uh, data sampled. Uh, th this is the true data. And we have this differentiable function D, which is usually a, a neural network. And Dx tries to be near one because this is the true data. And then let's say we input noise Z and we have some differentiable function G and X sampled from this model. So it's a fake data and the output of D, D tries to make it near zero, but G tries to make this output near one. That's where they actually compete with each other. So once this uh, network is trained, we can only use this for any input when we want to generate some samples. So this is the part we can use for a trained network. But for uh, VAEs, you can input data and look at the output if it represents the original data. You may ask, okay, what's the point if I'm just generating the data exactly? This can actually help you to find, uh, to, to detect some uh, abnormalities in your image. For example, if this was a brain image with some lesion and you, you input this brain image with lesion and in your output, let's say you reconstruct an image that doesn't have lesion and by just looking at the difference between these two, you can actually identify the location of the lesion uh, in the brain. But you cannot use GANs for, for, this, for that purpose. So, the key pieces of GANs is that um, it's uh, fast sampling and no inference and notion of optimizing directly for what you care about instead of the hidden representation. And um, let's try to see what uh, GANs are really optimizing in terms of all these KL divergence or different kinds of divergences that we discussed about. So the first question is, what is the optimal discriminator given generated and true distributions? So we can write the uh, optimization function for GANs um, like this, right? So uh, D is the discriminator, G is the generator. And for, for, this, for this term, we can write it as integral of P data of log of dx. And for this term, we can write it as um, integral of PZ log of one minus D of G of, G of C. So here, these are uh, some samples, um, some random samples that are input to your generator. And here for this integral, instead of having it over Z, we can actually have it over G where we replace um, the first term with the generator dis uh, distribution. And instead of using G of C, we can use D of X, but X comes from the uh, generator, dis uh, generator distribution. And if we can uh, combine these two integrals like this, and if we take derivative 
with respect to D, because we are interested in the optimal discriminator, we will see that the optimal uh, discriminator is actually P data of X divided by P data of X plus uh, P G of X. P G of X is the um, generative distribution. Okay, so then given this optimal discriminator, um, what is the what is the generative objective under under this discriminator? So let's put that um, this star that we learned here into our main objective, and instead of having this star, I can replace it with p data divided by p data x plus p g of x, and same thing here too, and then we can actually show that this term is equivalent to jensen shannon divergence of P data and PG, which means that it is KL divergence between P data and P data plus PG divided by two, plus KL divergence PG and P data plus PG and two. So if this is KL divergence between these two distributions, this is actually, we call it reversed KL divergence because remember KL divergence is not symmetric. So jensen shannon divergence is almost like a symmetric version of KL divergence because it looks, it computes both KL divergence and the reverse KL divergence. And this is how um, authors in the first original uh, Gantt paper um, explain the performance of their approach because instead of focusing on just the KL divergence, they focused on uh, jensen shannon divergence. So this is um, how you can visualize the KL divergence versus jensen shannon divergence. So for example, if we are interested in uh, KL between P and Q, and let's say we optimize over Q, so the best Q we can find is the green one here, and P of X is the original one. But if we optimize uh, Q and P, instead of P and Q, if you do it Q and P, then we actually do a better job. But how can we know what order we should use? So jensen shannon divergence actually performs uh, just between these two, okay? And um, another measure inspired from optimal transport is the earth mover distance or EM distance, which is defined as this. So let's say we want to measure distance between PR and PG. So it is the infimum of expectation where XYs are from some gamma distribution um, that minimizes X and Y, the difference between X and Y. So the goal uh, is to design an GAN objective function such that the generator minimizes the EM distance between data and the generated distributions. But uh, it is not uh, tractable to compute. So the uh, authors of this Wasserstein GAN uh, use this uh, Rubinstein duality that uh, makes it easier to deal with this uh, uh, EM distance. Basically, it turns out to be the supremum over some linear function space. You can, you can read this um, paper if you are interested in the details of this approach, but I'm trying to show you that um, we don't necessarily have to use uh, jensen shannon entropy, there are other kind of divergences that we can take advantage uh, to improve uh, GAN's uh, training. For example, in uh, this Wasserstein GAN paper, the authors show that um, the original GAN suffers from vanishing gradients, but um, with W GAN, we can actually get linear gradients that will help us uh, with the training. And they also show that the Wasserstein distance is correlated with sample quality. So as the Wasserstein uh, distance get smaller, the quality of the generated images uh, get better and better. But uh, with the original GAN, it can actually um, uh, be really unrobust over iterations. Okay, so uh, we covered a lot in this course uh, and what we covered was really just the tip of the iceberg. 
uh, there is so much more to discuss uh, in these uh, fields. For example, we can talk about uh, semi-supervised learning. So in the case where we have so much unlabeled data, um, but little bit labeled data, can we actually use our expertise both from unsupervised learning and supervised learning for better uh, predictions or representations? Or we can also uh, move to reinforcement learning from here, or maybe adversarial robustness where if we are developing machine learning models or deep learning models uh, in presence of some attackers, can we actually make sure that our models are uh, robust to, to these uh, attacks and also many more. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. I will stop uh, recording here, but um, I want to hear your questions now. Let me see.